Hey folks! Welcome back to Let's Play Suzuki Bakuhatsu. I'm your host, CPC Gamer, and in our last episode, I left you wondering what on earth this thing is. Well, wouldn't you know it, this is the level select. If you hit left and right, the game will give you a choice of two different times, each one with a different bomb for you to deal with. I mean, there's no indication as to what you're going to get, it's just a neat little thing for you to do. Although with that said, I do know what's behind each of these, and I'm going to go to 215 first of all, because that way I get to save my favourite stage for last. Now see, the main problem with the level selection, at least as far as a Let's Play is concerned, is that you can only do one of the two presented stages before the game picks another two. Now I'm going to show off every stage, roughly in order, but it's going to take a mixture of editing magic and time travel witchcraft and look at all them pixels! It will also take me having a lot of time on my hands. Sorry, I was, you know, distracted by bad image compression. Also, what the heck is it going on in this intro sequence? Like, am I back playing LSD? Because... This thing is flowing about as coherently as the Dream Emulator did. Just don't think about it. Just look at this wireframe model of our next stage. It's a train crossing barrier, which probably has greater significance in Japan than anywhere else, because these things are everywhere in Japan. Now, this stage introduces two new tools, the cog wrench and the spanner. And there's no practical difference between those tools and the screwdriver, it's just what specifically we use them on. Oh, yeah! This level also introduces the idea of tripwires, so we now have, like, 10 seconds to disarm the entire bomb. Come on, come on, come on! There we go. Oh, and of course we don't have 10 seconds to disarm the bomb. If you can dismantle whichever component was hiding the tripwire, you will reset the timer to... whatever it was before. Now, there are actually some levels later on in this game that will give you a tripwire, or like a loaded trap, but the game will automatically select the wrong components. So you have to be careful and think about what you're doing, just instead of just mashing go. Now, thankfully, this is not one of those stages. The device is at the top of this column, and there's nothing hidden in the column, so you are free to just take it apart as quickly as you can. So yeah, I think this stage has greater cultural significance in Japan, because... I mean, train barriers like this are everywhere. Or at least in the places where I stayed. I mean, maybe not rigged with explosives. Maybe. I don't know, because I didn't feel the urge to dismantle any to find out, because I was too busy playing arcade games. And it's actually kind of surprising, because taking stuff apart and tinkering with it is usually my jam. I mean, that's what attracted me to this game in the first place. You know, that and the patently ridiculous nature of it all. Alright, one more, and then we can get down to business. Because dismantling the signal post is not business. It's a... It, it's a mid-morning meeting at best. And those are the absolute opposite of business. Now, in order to undo the glass case, we need to undo all four screws. However, every time we turn a screw, that hammer rocks back and forth. And if it rocks too far and hits the golden component, it will set off the device and explode. Therefore, we need to take our time rather than just frantically working. It's a very good method of building tension. You've got a time limit, but you have to go slowly. I mean, this is actual survival horror tech, and I love survival horror! Now, this one is... the... blue wire, I do believe. Let's find out! Yeah, alright! Oh yeah, that's what I was gonna say! The soundtrack to this game might be vaguely familiar to Japanese music fans, because the music in this game is made by Fantastic Plastic Machine, a Japanese DJ who fell through a wormhole and got stuck in the swing in 60s, but who somehow found a way to make CDs and send them back through time to the present day to let us know that he's okay. Like seriously, go listen to Bachelor Pad. Or Hello and Goodbye, or... I mean, hell, they're all good. 
Also, a fantastic plastic machine did some soundtrack work with the loop in the third guys, and that's why Suzuki's gun makes the same noise as Lupin's. Marvel at the interconnected nature of all things. I mean, case in point, apparently we're in the Mushroom Kingdom now. Although that war pipe has seen better days. As has this green screen technology. It's fine, it's 2000, we didn't know how to do it yet. That's a good picture though. Like, I'd have that as my wallpaper. I mean, I wouldn't, because it's all blurry, but... You know. Oh man, it's this stage! You've heard about it, but now we're actually going to do it. Our next stage is the moon. I like the moon, because it is close to us. Now the first step is to turn a little bit, and... Yeah. This whole contraption is just behind the moon if you just, you know, turn your head a little bit. But I mean, you can only see it on a really clear night though, so that's why not a lot of people know about it. Now, I'm gonna do something I probably shouldn't do, and waste a little bit of time. Because we don't need to take these two screws off. But if we do... There we go. This green tunnel means that we can transition to the innards of whatever device we are currently working on. It's pretty much always a trap that will send you into an endless corridor of infinite screws, and I forgot this one was timed. <laughs> Better hope we can get a move on. And you see, this is why I put this on easy mode. Like, I can afford to get distracted and forget what I'm doing for a couple of seconds. So, now we have split the moon in half. Does this remind you of anything? Well, if I get my screwdriver... How about now? Yep! Turns out the moon itself is a flathead screw. Now, see, the moon is one of my favorite stages in the entire game, and this is why, because it exemplifies what this game is. Like, it is a very clever puzzle game that's not afraid to be completely off the wall and really stupid. Oh yeah, and it's also got some very clever background character building. I mean, it's hard to hear because of the game noise and the beautiful commentary. But Suzuki is singing to herself as she's working. She's singing a song called Tsurippu, or Tulip in English. And it's a traditional Japanese tune. And it's one of the very first songs that Japanese children will learn when they're in school. I mean, I, I guess the English equivalent is something like Old MacDonald or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. But Tulipu is a cute song about how tulips grow in rows of red, white, and yellow, and they all look beautiful when they bloom. And I could sing along, but I'm not going to, because I can barely sing in English. Forget keeping a tune in Japanese. Also, hi! I forgot to explain this. You can turn certain tools backwards as you go, so you can tighten screws as well as loosening them. And you'll need to do both to the cogs in this stage to reveal the hidden screws in order to continue. And now back to this. The fact that Suzuki is singing nursery rhymes while dismantling a torpedo the size of the moon... A. is not a sentence I ever thought I would say in my life, and B. gives you an idea of what she's like as a person. This incredibly dangerous thing is literally child's play to her. And having a cute little jingle playing is a very Japanese thing. I mean, in fact, to go back to the previous stage, most Japanese train stations play a little tune as the train is about to leave, so the passengers know they have until the end of that tune to get on the train. And they're really cute little tunes. And popular, too. Like, they are so popular that JR East released a CD of them. And entirely unrelated, my phone's default ringtone is now Ikebukuro Station. Oh, hey, look at that. It's the detonator. Just, you know, misplaced a little bit. Now, for this one, you can cut either wire so long as it is not sparking with electricity. And it's tricky because there's a bit of input lag between the time you hit the button and the game actually cutting the wire, so you have to be really quick on the draw for that one. And luckily I was. This time. I mean, there's a, 
a later stage that does the same sparking wire thing, but one of the wires will detonate the bomb regardless, so... I really hope I remember which one is which. <laughs> and isn't this a cute little scene? Like, how much work went yeah, into yeah. making that when it was only on the screen for about two seconds? Like, you wouldn't get that in a modern game. Now... Yeah, why not? Before we go, let's do one more. Let's do a really stupid one that's quick and it doesn't make any degree of sense. I mean, even by this game's standards, it's it's pretty out there. So let's do 1012. I mean, I like how I say that as if that has any indication of what each time signifies. But, you know, trust me, this is a weird one. And that sentence is grammatically incorrect. And the most maddening thing of all is that there's no direct translation of the error into English. She said, I'm thirsty, but, like, without indicating that those two words are connected to one another. I mean, that's the best I can do with that one. I mean, it makes sense because it's her thoughts, I suppose, and, I mean, whose thoughts run in proper, correct sentences? It's just really annoying that I want to point out an error but cannot properly explain it. Also, is she wearing a smartwatch? Did those even exist in 2000? Man, is my face going to be red when it turns out that's just a really big, regular watch? Although, whatever it is, it's ticking pretty loudly. I wonder why. Ah, psych! The bomb is in the iced coffee. Because, of course, it's in the iced coffee. Now, the reason that I choose to continue on to this stage is because finding the detonator is actually really simple. You just hit up over and over and over and over and over again until you find it. Oh, that message says it's up to you whether or not you want to live. Which, of course it is, because I'm the one with the wire cutters. Although I forget if I mentioned it yet, but the game calls them nippers, and I think that's cute. Oh nay, here's the device. But what about these messages on the screen? Well, that one says Bakuhatsu Shinai. It will not explode. And that one says Bakuhatsu Sudu. It will explode. Now, the game alternates between the two with every step we take. So you have to get to the detonator, having taken an odd number of steps. So the message we get is, it will not explode. And I just did that wrong. I know you have to step back and do a loop before you get to the end, I just forget what that loop is. Whoops! <laughs> you know, I considered drawing a map, but then I thought, nah, I know I need to do a loop, I will be fine. And so I was. Eventually. And that was a pretty boring item deconstruction screen game. I mean, you might be wondering what I was hoping to see given that the level was a cup of ice and everything, but... I mean, have you seen magnified ice crystals? Like, damn! Also, I've been there! That's Narita International Airport! And it's also the stage Twilight Airport from Sega Super GT. I mean, it kind of summed up my experience of being in Japan that the very first thing you do is arrive in a video game. I and mean, it was a good time, and it set up a recurring trend. But that is a story for another day. So join us next time for some more crazy contraptions. And until next time, goodbye.